Without further ado, I'd like to introduce to you our speaker today, Dr. Ian McDonald. Uh, Dr. McDonald is the chair of the Department of Ophthalmology at the University of Alberta. He is an ophthalmologist who specializes in the understanding and treatment of inherited retinal diseases. Dr. McDonald is known internationally for his research on corduroyemia, including the development of the genetic test now used to diagnose the condition. He is currently leading Canada's first trial of gene therapy for an eye disease. Um, without further ado, I'd like to welcome uh, Dr. Ian McDonald. Thank you. Thank you so much for the kind invitation, and, and thank you very much for your support over the years for the work that uh, our group has been doing. It's not about me. It's a larger community that I'm working with uh, at the University of Alberta, of vitreoretinal surgeons, uh, genetic counselor, and I'll show you some of the team. So here, here I just wanted to let you know about uh, my grant support uh, from the Foundation Fighting Blindness here in Canada, from the Croyder Emu Research Foundation, from uh, CIHR, that's the Canadian Institutes for Health Research, uh, Alberta Innovates Health Solutions, so your tax dollars at work, um, the uh, um, Alberta Enterprise and Advanced Education that has provided us some of the partnered funding that was necessary to put some of the sophisticated imaging equipment together for our, our laboratory. Here's our team. Admittedly, uh, uh, a year ago, there's Matt Tennant, a vitreoretinal surgeon, uh, Stephanie Chan, a genetic counselor, very important in terms of informing patients who might want to avail themselves of a gene therapy trial, Tanya Bubala, who's an expert in regulatory affairs, uh, Elena Posita Chavez, who's a biochemist, Eve Sauve, who's a neuroscientist, Paul Freund, who's a graduate student and now resident in our program, and uh, Shelley Benjamini, who's doing her PhD on uh, some of these issues at the University of British Columbia. So I wanted to just say uh, how important it is to undertake uh, vision research. Um, one in nine Canadians have a serious eye problem by the age of 65, and one in three will have a problem with their vision by age 75. And uh, about, there's about 4 million Canadians who are noted by, in 2007 to have uh, an age-related blinding disorder. It's interesting that here in Alberta, despite these statistics, uh, we do not as yet have public funding for vision rehabilitation. Inherited eye disease is a leading cause of irreversible blindness. And uh, Dr. Um, Karani gave a wonderful talk. Uh, I know he didn't have enough time. Uh, and. Uh, it's just a very complicated area. There are very few treatments available. Uh, in many cases, as he pointed out, the uh, management is through supportive care and vision aids, and it's so important for uh, you to see all of the suppliers and vendors coming here to talk to you about uh, things that are available. There are therapies on the horizon, uh, cell therapies, and I'm going to talk a little bit about encapsulated cell therapy, uh, stem cell therapies. You've seen that in the news. If you have got the Globe and Mail in the um, lifestyle section, there was a, an article on stem cell therapy. Retinal transplantation, uh, that was the actual article. It was on retinal transplantation of stem cells. The retinal prosthesis, um, pharmacotherapy with valproic acid, gene therapy, and gene therapy isn't just gene replacement, uh, that's one aspect of gene therapy, but there are many, many aspects of gene therapy. I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, an individual seen here in this photograph. He's carrying a cane. All of those individuals have a genetic eye disease, and uh, their disorder affects them, so it's affecting both their rods and cones. And remember that uh, the rods and cones are the major photoreceptors at the back of the eye. And as Dr. Karani said, uh, the rods are the ones that are affected mostly in retinitis pigmentosa. And the cones are affected uh, secondarily. And if you use a photograph of the um, eye, uh, the back of the eye, you can see that the rods and the cones actually are rod-like and cone-like. The rods are forming a vision in dim light and the cones are forming vision in, uh, in bright light. So for many years, it was known that uh, treating animal models with um, 
neuroprotective agents that you could prevent the degeneration of the photoreceptors. And there's a certain cytokine or a protein called ciliary neurotrophic factor that was found to be very effective in preventing um, the regression of vision loss in animal models. Understand that many of the human therapies that have come forward have first undergone extensive testing in animal models of human disease to make sure that they're effective and safe. So and in this um, slide, you can see that on, uh, on your right, uh, the section of the retina is showing that the cells look quite smaller and the retina is undergoing degeneration. With the use of a protein that you could inject into the dog's eye, the retinal layers are maintained for longer and then hopefully that animal will maintain vision. There was a clinical trial, a phase one trial. Uh, phase one is what we call a safety trial to make sure that the, that the actual treatment is safe in humans. There was a phase one trial that I had the, the uh, privilege of being um, a part of through the National Eye Institute in Washington a number of years ago. And this was an implanted device that was put in the eye of humans. And the device had a core of human cells that had a number of copies of a gene implanted into it. And the, these cells, these human cells, would then pump out a protein into the vitreous cavity of the eye to protect the retina from undergoing degeneration. So it was a surgical procedure to actually put this implanted device into the eye. Here you can see on your left a diagram of this tiny white seed like a, uh, that has been clipped into the eye and that device is going to be secreting a protein into the eye that would hope to prevent the retina from undergoing degeneration. You can see the pupil on the right, maybe you can't see it very well, is, is dilated and you can see this little device right, right in the inferior part of the pupil and that device is pumping out fluid into the, into the vitreous cavity. The clinical trial obligated the researchers to remove the device from the eye after six months to make sure that the device hasn't created inflammation, hadn't had inflammatory cells come into the device and begin to destroy the device. And so you can see uh, in this slide, you can see a device that was not implanted and a device that was implanted and taken out of the eye and remarkably the cells, the human cells that are in this device are still living, they are still secreting a protein but there's no inflammation. The capsule, the device hasn't been breached by the inflammatory cells of the eye. In fact there, were, there was relatively little inflammation at all from this device put into the eye, much like let's say doing cataract surgery and putting a lens in the eye, uh, the eye tolerated this device very well. So it there was great hope that this device might be able to prevent vision loss in patients with retinitis pigmentosa. Unfortunately, it didn't work for this individual here. I've blocked out their pictures, but uh, uh, for Larry, it, he, he underwent this experimental surgery and it showed that the device was safe, but it didn't improve his sight. And this project uh, has not been restarted. Uh, it has been used, uh, and I don't think the trial results are available as yet, for age-related macular degeneration, especially the dry form of macular degeneration, to see if it's going to be uh, effective in that form of uh, retinal degeneration. But Larry understood that there is an opportunity for gene therapy on the horizon. And I'm sure that many of you are aware of uh, the work that's being done in Philadelphia on Leber's congenital amaurosis. And uh, if you haven't seen this book, I would highly recommend it to you. This is a book by Ricky Lewis. She's a, 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 a um, writer. You can 
find it on Google and, and it's not very expensive. It takes you all the way through uh, the trials on gene therapy to the present. Gene therapy had undergone a moratorium until recently when uh, the advent of gene therapy in the eye has shown to be safe and efficacious. And it really comes uh, with the treatment of this boy on the cover, uh, Corey, who underwent gene therapy. He had Leber's congenital amaurosis, a childhood form of retinitis pigmentosa, uh, and couldn't see very well, and underwent gene therapy. And uh, prior to the gene therapy, he wouldn't have been able to navigate through this room very, very easily. But after the gene therapy, very much able to navigate. And it was uh, startling for the researchers and the family to see how, how much he had benefited from the gene therapy. And as Dr. Karani had mentioned, there are a number of gene therapies uh, throughout the world that are being undertaken, many in Leber's congenital amaurosis. We're starting our th gene therapy trial in Edmonton uh, probably in the new year. Uh, we had hoped to be doing it now, but it has been taking a long time to get there. There are trials on Stargardt disease. There are trials on Usher syndrome. Uh, there are trials on neovascular age-related macular degeneration. And as I found out yesterday, there is a trial ongoing in Miami on Leber's hereditary optic neuropathy, which I wasn't uh, aware of. So it's a fast-moving uh, field, and uh, I don't pretend to be the expert on, uh, on all of these things. And so I'm here to learn as well. Um, a couple of years ago, there was a fellow who came to see me from that wonderful hockey town in Manitoba called Flinflon, and um, he said, am I a candidate for gene therapy? Uh, he'd had visual field changes uh, throughout his uh, life, but mainly in the mid-30s, he was noticing that his field of vision was getting much poorer. And uh, you can see here that there's a significant degree of retinal degeneration in both eyes. And he, all he has left is his small remaining patch of vision centrally. Uh, but he's maintaining central visual acuity as 20-20 in his right eye and even better than that in his left eye. So that's in comparison with uh, what a normal fundus or the back of the eye might look like. He had undergone or he had experienced a lot of retinal degeneration uh, over his lifetime to date. So... Um, he has, or had, by my estimation, choroideremia, just based on this phenotype, the clinical features. Um, the phenotype for choroideremia is very similar. Uh, in this case, here's another individual at age 26 who has a small patch of remaining retina that is functional, and he's developed a ring scotoma. He sees well in the middle, but there's a ring of vision that he doesn't see well in. We, we have in our program undertaken um, gene testing for patients with uh, choroideremia for many, many years and act as a reference laboratory. And the changes in the gene are many. Uh, they could be deletions of the genes or small changes in the reading segment of the gene, but all of these result in what we term absence of the protein. There's no protein that's being made from this gene that will be important in the normal biology of vision in these patients. And so our, our goal is to not only replace the gene, but have that gene functional and, re and replace the protein that's missing in individuals with this condition. And I think it was uh, alluded to, maybe not, ab about you know how what happens in RP and these related disorders. So choroideremia is a specific type of retinitis pigmentosa. It's a disorder that affects primarily men, but it does affect women as well. And we have, over the years, done many, many studies on patients to understand what happens in this condition. How does vision decline? What's the rate of progression of vision loss in terms of visual acuity and visual field? And this is a diagram showing the visual acuity. And visual acuity in men with this disorder is changing abruptly about age 50. 
uh, you can imagine that the, when the slope of this graph goes up, the individual over the age of 50 is beginning to lose their central vision quite abruptly. But up until that time, they've done very well. Visual field, the drop in the visual field occurs dramatically in the first 20 years of life, but after that, that small area of remaining central vision remains relatively stable and the curve is relatively flat up until the 60s. So it's important for us as uh, vision scientists to know about the natural history of any disorder and that's why these databases are important to know how individual uh, disorders affect the eye. What do we know about the natural history of the disorder? Because that's going to inform us as to how are we going to develop a therapy? What are going to be the predictors of, of uh, change with time? So we know the genetics of choroideremia. We understand how the disorder uh, progresses. We've got a gene vector to replace the, the normal gene with a, a sort of replace the mutant gene with a normal gene. And we have some wonderful vitreoretinal techniques that we can actually put the, these genes into the eye safely. We know that this vector is safe because of its trials with Leber's congenital amaurosis. It's well tolerated, well tolerated in patients and has not to date induced a significant immune reaction. And several patients from these trials have, have experienced a sustained improvement in visual function. So how do we do this? Well, we make a, uh, it's a surgical procedure. It requires uh, a vitreoretinal surgeon and uh, a microscope. The back of the eye, the central part of the back of the eye, the retina is blistered, and in that blister, the vector with the virus, the replacement virus, is being put underneath the retina and with time over a period of about 24 hours that blister flattens and then the cells take up the vector into them, into them the photoreceptors and the pigment epithelium and then begin to uh, make that protein. If we're going to do a, gen, uh, a gene therapy trial, we need to be very careful about uh, selecting patients in the initial phases to make sure the, the trial is safe. And we'll need to have some very sophisticated tools to understand if the treatment has in fact improved any visual, visual function. And so we're going to use uh, fine techniques of imaging and visual field uh, studies in these, in these individuals. So our 40-year-old patient underwent some tests he was genotyped. He was found to have the change in the gene that would make me know that he has choroideremia, so he's eligible based on his genotype. And that's really one of the important factors in doing gene testing. If there's a treatment, well, we've got to make sure that you, as that individual, do have a change in the gene that, and would be eligible for gene therapy. And we're going to use sophisticated techniques. This is his remaining retina. And you can see here, there's some black dots. If you can see, probably not uh, in the back, but in the front, you can see these black dots. These are the areas in which he doesn't see, and the colored dots are areas in which he does see. So after we do the gene therapy, we're going to be monitoring those spots to see if those spots improve in terms of vision. Here's how complicated it is to do gene therapy. I came back to Edmonton about six years ago, and I've been working at this ever since, uh, putting together a team, putting together the equipment, talking to the regulatory bodies, Health Canada, talking to the Health Protection Agency, uh, interacting with a vector production uh, company, with industry, in order to make the virus according to a very stringent qualities, and we're almost there, uh, but not quite yet. But it did, it has taken a good six years of planning to get to the phase of actually doing gene therapy. I wanted to briefly touch on the Foundation Fighting Blindness Registry of Patients uh, because for the future, for this trial and other trials, if your name is in there and you have choroideremia or Usher syndrome, people are going to know that this registry is there and it may link you to future clinical trials. 
So if, if we're going to undertake a clinical trial, uh, I think it's important to understand that this, at the present time, is really an experiment. It isn't as yet a treatment. It's certainly not uh, a therapy. We don't know yet. Uh, so it really isn't a cure. Remember that these are experiments, experiments, very important experiments. But I, as a physician, recognize that there is the probability of harm. And we have to know from the origi original trials that there is, uh, you know, what is the evidence? What evidence do we have that this therapy isn't going to cause any harm? And uh, then what is the benefit-risk ratio as well? And certainly the harm that we can cause is not just the, um, the physical harm that would occur through a surgical procedure, but there might be other harms that we don't recognize. All the anxiety that would go into an individual undergoing uh, an experimental therapy. So in order to try to keep people up to date with what we're doing, uh, we've created a web uh, website, uh, chmgenetherapy.ca, that we continue to update. And um, I think I should stop there and uh, entertain any questions that you may have. I have a, I have a question on the encapsulated cell transplant uh, example that you gave. Uh, my understanding was that uh, it was to, to uh, help stabilize the degeneration of retinitis pigmentosa rather than enhance the vision. So early on, uh, you stated that uh, that fact, and then at the end of the at the end of the presentation or at the end of the experiment, you said that it didn't really improve his health. So this, uh, the the uh, experiment has been canceled or stopped. So, can you just clarify that for me? Yeah, I might have misused a few words there. Um, so it did not appear that there was any change in visual improvement, and the. Even though this was a so-called phase one trial for safety, and it appeared to be safe, embedded in this small trial, they tried to use uh, two different doses of, uh, let's say the implant device was going to secrete two different doses. And it didn't appear that there was any difference in between a low secreting dose of the implant device and a high secreting dose of the device. Neither did it cause toxicity and neither did it cause any improvement. And there hadn't been any enthusiasm to go further with a larger trial. With the therapy, um, I've still got a pretty good sight vision now. Um, when we're talking stabilizing or are we talking repairing? I, I would like to see it stabilizing. Um, so the patients who would undergo any gene therapy trial, imagine that the treated eye will be compared with the untreated eye, and those individuals will be followed over a period of time. For the gene therapy th trial on choroideremia, we're expecting to, to treat individuals who have a very small patch of remaining retina that's undergoing degeneration, and quite rapidly after the age of 50. Uh, and we would be following those individuals over a period of two years. So we would, we would expect and hope at a minimum that the area that had been treated, that would not undergo degeneration. It would stabilize or the slope would be less. And so therein lies the, the difficulty. We don't know as yet. Um, we have some uh, indication from the early trials of McLaren in Oxford in London uh, sorry, not in London, in Oxford, England, uh, that uh, it would appear that there was a change in the areas that were treated, that the, those areas were able to see a little bit better using a small spot of light. They could use a light of less intensity and it would be picked up less than they had before the therapy. So there seems to be some functional improvement as well. I got if I'm getting too technical, yes. you just tell me. I got a question. What's the difference between gene therapy and, 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 and GM, genetically modified, or is there a difference? Right, yes, you might have a genetically unmodified individual. That would be... Uh, <laughs> so uh, there have been some concerns, uh, especially... Um, so genetically modified, really, you think about that in terms of uh, agriculture. 
uh, for humans, um, we are putting a virus underneath the retina and we are naively saying, okay, well, that's just localized. It's just going to be in that area of the retina and the cells and the pigmented layer and the retina are going to pick up that virus. The virus is going to go into the genetic material and stay there. It's not going to go anywhere else. But in fact, some of these uh, virus particles, they don't replicate, but they can be found in the tears of patients who undergo this therapy. So there is a concern, it's ac I would say it's academic, uh, that the virus would go into the uh, reproductive system and then uh, integrate into uh, the, the human genome and replicate beyond that. But uh, it's a very academic uh, concern at the present time. I hope, I hope I'm not misleading you in that regard, but uh, in these gene therapy experiments, uh, we are very mindful of the fact that we're treating people who are of reproductive age and um, so want to make sure that it doesn't go into the reproductive system and then create mutations that we hadn't intended all, at all. So these, these viruses that carry the gene are thought not to integrate into the, into the genetic material, but in fact, in some cases they do. And so if they integrate in an area and when they integrate randomly, they could by chance disrupt a normal gene and therefore uh, you're worried about that or have concern about that. And so when we go to the regulatory authorities, we're having to talk about that. Okay. So, Dr. McDonald, I have a couple of questions, um, one of which I believe that you only cover or the treatment is applied to only one eye or only a portion of the eye or... or That's how? correct. Okay. So we're only going to treat one eye and just the central part of the eye. Okay. Of, uh, in the case of Leber's congenital amaurosis, some of the patients who originally had just the one eye treated and it was shown to be safe and effective, they have had, now had the other eye treated. I'm not aware of what the results have been, but it, there were concerns raised that if you had had gene therapy in one eye, well, what would be the risk if you did, then did gene therapy in the other eye and created an immune reaction? And uh, to date, there has been none. Although we do expect to use high-dose steroids uh, around the time of the surgery to prevent any immune reaction. Mm. And by high dose, I would mean in the tens of milligrams of prednisone over a period of weeks. I see. And so what stage is um, this clinical trial in? Is it phase three or phase two? Okay, so um, very good question. Uh, so phase one means uh, a trial of safety. Phase two is a trial of efficacy, showing that there, that there is a biological effect, that there is some improvement. Phase three is when uh, a trial goes out beyond a, a discrete number of individuals, let's say 100, uh, into the into the marketplace uh, where we see a number of individuals undergoing therapies uh, and we're looking at a larger population. And is the Libra's congenital amaurosis at that stage, at phase three already? Or? Um, I would say it's at phase two. I don't think it's in phase three, uh, but uh, correct me if I'm wrong. I'm ready to be corrected. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, I noticed that RP wasn't on your list of gene therapies. Is it, is it not uh, accessible to gene therapy? Uh, well, uh, so Leber's congenital amaurosis, you can think of it as an, an infantile form of RP. Uh, so you, you could think of it that way. Uh, for So some of the therapies in the humans, well, all of them, I think, require some experiments in animals. And so there are experiments that are ongoing at the present time in animal models of RP. Um, 
and uh, but I'm not aware of any human ones. I'm sure they're going to be coming. Some of these disorders are not going to require gene replacement as much as uh, turning off the gene that's mutant. So we talked about uh, recessive disorders, I think, uh, in the earlier session, where you have two copies that are abnormal, and then the person has a disorder. But there are forms of retinitis pigmentosa in which you just have one copy that's abnormal, and it, it makes the biology of the cells abnormal. And so we're having to, to what we term silence or turn off that, that abnormal copy. And that doesn't as much require a gene replacement, but putting in something into the eye that can turn off that gene, make it silent. And that's, a, that's the big uh, area of research in RP at the present time, trying to silence, for example, the, the common form of dominantly inherited retinitis pigmentosa is due to mutations in the rhodopsin gene. That's the, the gene that makes the protein that, uh, that that uh, has vitamin A attached to it that allows you to see. And if you have a change in the rhodopsin gene, uh, it can trigger a dumb inherited form of RP. So we, but we want to turn off that mutant copy. And the way we do that is using a silencing uh, technique. And the way we can do that is, is creating a vector that creates a silencing of the gene. So it's gene therapy in a different way. It's not replacing, it's, it's knocking out or silencing that gene. It's a very complicated area, and uh, I, would, I would suggest that even though I'm working on a very specific form of retinal degeneration, there are others throughout the world who are working on gene therapies for RP. It appears to me that there's the age group that you are showing for the men is where hormones are changing. Do you work with that aspect also? Uh, no, I don't. Um, I'm not sure what hormones are going. I'll have to think about that. Um, I, that that's a stumper. I, I'm, I, I don't know that, the, that there's any evidence, especially in this, this particular condition that I'm studying, is that, uh, that there is a menopausal or andropausal uh, correlation. Uh, it's unlinked to uh, hormonal changes. So these are, these are proteins and pathways that are acting in the eye, not, not elsewhere. But it's a, it's a good question to ask, and one that I hadn't thought of. Thank you. I'd like to uh, thank Dr. McDonald for sharing his knowledge with us today.